Okay, so today the data science incubator will cover the idea of test-driven development, which is one way of developing software, and one uh, and proposes one specific time uh, when to write tests, and that is before you write code. And this approach is not um, always suitable. Uh, I like how it is expressed in the chapter philosophy of um, Master and Shiny. In the sorry, in the chapter testing. Uh, for mastering Sharni, because it shows that there is like uh, summarizes the idea in 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 this that there is three times when you might want to write tests. One, and let's start from the bottom to the top, is when you have discovered a bug, and you know you write a test to expose the bug first, then you fix it, and then you leave that test there uh, as a canary in the mine in case that you know there is a regression and the code starts to behave again badly, and then the test will immediately tell you whoa. There, there is the problem here. So it kind of stops you from fixing bugs twice, basically. Then there may be the time when more of, uh, of us might be used to writing tests is this idea of writing tests after you have written the code because it's very common that sometimes we don't really start with a very, very specific idea about what the code should do. So we kind of experiment and try things out and clarify our thinking in the same way that we craft the paragraph in prose. And as we write, we, we think, uh, better ideas and we publish it. But when you do uh, know uh, what the behavior of the function that, or the code that you're writing should be, uh, let me see because I think I have someone else trying to join. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, hi, Taylor. When you do know what's the behavior of the code uh, that you expect, then you, uh, you can use this idea of writing the code uh, for the test before writing the code for production. And what I want to show is an example, very simple, using R and using uh, a couple of packages that we are already uh, using. Many of us already use R, uh, many of us use R packages, and many of us use test that. So with all of that, I want to show you know, how to actually do it, and then hopefully uh, spark some conversation. So let's uh, start from scratch because this is also an opportunity to re revisit uh, some of the um, ideas that we have been discussing in um, the data science incubator and outside. For example, the idea of refactoring is very tightly connected to test-driven development because basically there is three things that test-driven development proposes. One is you write the test. Second, you write the code that makes that test pass. The first test will fail because you haven't written the code yet. And then third, you refactor your code so that you end up with no technical debt, and then you move on. So let's let's see how that works. So first, I'm gonna use uh, the package use this to create a package. Uh, create a package, and I'm gonna stick that package here in Git. Let's call it TDD. Uh, so now test that is creating a package for me and opening a new uh, R Studio session with it. So basically that has uh, the infrastructure that I need except for um, the, uh, the except for the test infrastructure. So create package will add uh, no test that folder. But actually I wonder if I if I create let's let's say that I want to create a function that greets someone by name uh, and if you uh, give no name to the function then it will say just hello world. But let me see if I do, so use this includes a function called use r. So there is where you would you know, tell the name of the file that will host the function that you're about to write. Uh, so let's call this function grid, and therefore the file associated to it will be called grid. But I'm a, a little bit experimental here. By doing this, I'm expecting uh, use this to be clever enough to add the testing infrastructure to this package, which is right now kind of bare bones. And actually, let's see. So for now, it looks like it has only created the uh, R directory here. Uh, let's see if I refresh. Yeah, so for now, I, it only added uh, the file grid.r inside the folder R. That is the job of use this. But this file is empty, as you see. And if you're standing on an R file, then test that knows how to create, or oh, use this, knows how to create the equivalent file where you should put your tests, and that's where we're going to be working. So you do use test, and uh, immediately uh, this new file will be created called test 
minus grid.r and is created inside the folder tests test that so that's all magic that happens uh, for us so as you can see uh, it it has created the testing infrastructure that we need so it starts with a toy um, example like a template for what a test looks like and this is it basically you know many of us already have written some tests so it starts with a title uh, and then you know some kind of code that ends with an expectation about what a code should do but what we have here is just a toy example uh, let's say that what we want is to write uh, a function as we said before that is called grid and the name of the function I won't repeat it in the title because it's already that information already exists in the name of the file here in test minus grid. So what I'm gonna do is just say what I expect this test to, to do. So let's say that uh, what I'm gonna, I'm thinking that, okay, grid with no input uh, returns hello world, for example, oops. So this is the basic, uh, the first test that you know I, I imagine is okay. I imagine a function that is called grid. That function doesn't yet exist. So if I run this function uh, on the console, you see that I get an error. It says I could not find the function grid, and that is part of the failing uh, test. And I expect, you know, I imagine this function that when it works, when it, if I call it with no argument, with nothing here in between parentheses, the output of this will be hello world. So this is the first step in um, test driven development. You just start with with a failing test. So how uh, do you run this? Okay, you have uh, several ways to run tests. You can just run the expectation itself, and you should get the same error that you get if you experiment on the console. You can run the whole thing from top to bottom, like from one to, to three, and then you will get a little closer to what you would experience if you run the tests using test that. Uh, sorry, sorry, using test that as part of our studio. And then the third way is clicking here on more and clicking on test package, or as you saw in the um, uh, proposed shortcut, doing control shift T, which is what I do like almost by reflex. And there's also a way to run just one test file. So instead of running all the tests, you can run just this one file. Okay, so we started uh, with a failing test. So the, this is the first step in test-driven development. Now the second step is to start writing the code. But before we do that, I wanted to kind of reflect on why it is important to start, to start by writing the test. And the reason is because you could write a test that is wrong. So the very first thing that we would like to do is to verify that the test fails if the code does not what we think it should do. So some, if the code is if the test is wrong, maybe the test will fa will pass even if the, if the code is wrong, right? So the one really nice thing of test driven development is that you are sure that um, the the test uh, with no equivalent code actually does fail as you would expect. So now I can jump to uh, this other file grid.r, which you know you can just click on there or you can run the function. Oops. You can run the function use r if uh, you are very fancy, and that will automatically open that. So what do we need? Okay, we need a function called grid, right? It's gonna be a function that, uh, you know, the first, the second thing that you do is you write the minimum amount of code, and that is key. You, you know that you are done when the test passes. So you don't go crazy writing like, you know, code for half an hour. You just do the tiny minimum work that you need to get that test specifically. To pass, and then you 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 know extend your test to test some other behavior, and then you move on and on and on. So, just to get this particular test to pass, all I need is this function to return "Hello World." So, with this, if I press now Shift Control T, I should see. Let's see what happens. If I didn't commit any mistake, I see here the test now pass. So that's the very first cycle of um, test-driven de development. And I, you know, if, if this goal was a little bit more complex, maybe I would now take the time to refactor uh, it uh, so that I don't end up with any technical debt. It is also a good time to uh, commit. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, git in it. It, does, it doesn't even, it, it's not a, okay. I'm gonna say, okay, either the new function greet um, with very basic behavior, right? 
and now we move on. So a second test, and now um, something maybe a bit uh, closer to you know the, the ultimate functionality that I imagine is a case where grid, given a name, greets that person. So let's say that I'm going to duplicate this code, and uh, with a name greets by name. Or let's say it be more explicit, output something like hello. Uh, here where, where I say name is just a placeholder. You, I think you know what I mean. So this is the new test that I would like to write. How do I do that? Okay, so in this case, say that you know I'm, I'm Mauro, so I would expect to get hello Mauro if I say greet parenthesis Mauro. Of course, this, this test will fail because uh, that functionality still does not exist. I should get something like there is no argument uh, you know, where, to which to pass the string Mauro. And let's see if I get that. And there you go. So there is an unused argument to which I have tried to pass Mauro. So you know, I'm kind of close to, to a good stopping point once I make this test pass and then refactor it a little bit to show you a complete a second cycle of TDD. So let's go now to grid.r and let's make that test pass. So now let's say that the first thing I need is an argument. Uh, let's call it name. And uh, you know this could take uh, as default could take world, right? Which is what uh, you know we expected to uh, the function to output if I give no name to this uh, grid function. And then here, I could just pass this to paste and say, okay, if I give you no, if I give you a name, paste uh, name. And if I give you no name, the default of name will be words. So it will be output, the output will be paste uh, name. So I now run my test, shift control T, and I see all tests pass. So effectively I have kind of completed this second loop. So now it's another good time to, uh, oops, to say, uh, let me make this a little bigger. Uh, let's check the status. Let's add everything and say uh, new um, greet gains argument name. Okay. So with that, now I'm uh, also uh, able, uh, I have enough kind of backup, enough safety net to start being a bit more aggressive in my refactoring. For example, if I wanted to, um, I don't know, to, re to, to change the style of this, to print like that, I could do it. You know, after every change, I could just click or hit shift control T and run every test to make sure I haven't broken anything. Uh, or I could do something maybe a bit more useful, like to check, for example, the type of name. So I could say something like stop, if not, uh, say is character name, to say something like that. So that uh, good, uh, so that would be actually against, sorry, against TDD. So if I wanted to check the input, what I could do is go back to the test and now write um, that, that test first. So let's say that what I want is with a number throws an error. Let's write this last test and we're done. So now what I expect is if I say grid number one, for example, I get something that is an error. So here, what I would say is something that matches the error that I expect. Uh, and let's see what I could get uh, in a moment. And instead of using the expectation expect equal, I can say expect error. So I expect the error something like is not character. Uh, if I pass the number one to the function grid. So let's press shift control T, see what I get. I should get a failing test because I haven't yet added that behavior. There you go. It did not throw the expected error and notice how it tells me exactly which line of the test is the one that did not show the expected behavior. And finally here, I can add the line that I wanted. So now I'm going to first stop if it is not a character and then I'm going to do the action that I want. So let's press one more time, Shift, Control, T. Uh, I still get a failing test su suggesting that maybe the, um, the test 
uh, message is not exactly the one that I typed. Uh, so let's see if I can fix that. Uh, I see it says is character is not true. Okay, so this second argument to expect error is a regular expression. So I could say something like not dot uh, star and to say something more kind of to match just a little bit of the message. So enough. Um, in, sorry, actually that won't match. So character dot star uh, character not true. So now that I know what the message should look like, I'm gonna match this, this, and this, and you know, just to be safe, you know, if, if it has these uh, strings, it is very likely the error message that I am looking for. So that confirms that the function does throw an error and very likely is the one that I want. So that is it. So we have completed the cycle um, of writing a test, writing the code, and refactoring. One refactoring here could be to extract, for example, this into my custom function as top if not character, for example. And here could be a function that uh, takes an x and then does this. So for now, I've just done the same thing. So I press Shift Control T. Uh, it looks like it fails because the uh, function has been defined but not called. So if I now do call the function with name, I should expect the error, and it does. And now you know I can be even more aggressive and extract the code outside. Shift Control T again, and I have effectively. Ooh, actually, boo 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 boo. Stop if not character. You see, well, nice that it is telling me object name no found. Ah, there you go. So this is an X. And this is you know, the beauty of you know, being uh, backed up by tests. So if I make a mistake, immediately the test will tell me. So that's why test driven development allows us to move really fast because you know, we always have the almost 100% you know, core of tests and any change that we do, we will know immediately what's, what's going wrong. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna stop here and, uh, and look forward to comments. Um, I guess I'll start. I think that this toy example Say is that, like this is very much a toy example mm -hmm. of test trip element. Yeah. Um, in practice, um, the like write a test, write some code, run the test cycle mm -hmm. tends to be uh, much larger. Like, I personally could not imagine writing a single test and then writing the code to pass it versus, um, like, if I had that greet function, I already would have a plan of, like, what are the major pillars of functionality that I would expect? Mm -hmm. So I would put the, probably the uh, hello world and the hello morrow as my first test. Mm, the two things together. That first iteration of code to pass both of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then without getting too far into the, the whole other conversation of how to write good tests um, and make sure your tests are actually testing, um, whenever I write a uh, any tests, I also write negative tests. So that is the, um, in, in test that, it's the expect not equal, I mm -hmm. believe, is the command. Mm -hmm. um, so I would write a test for no argument, hello world, yes argument, uh, hello morrow, uh, yes argument, expect that you don't get hello world back. Right, um, writing tests for behavior that you don't want is as important as writing tests for behavior that you do want. That's cool. That's cool. Anyone uh, has comments on that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's crucial that you know things are by the book are always like cool, but then in practice, you know, it's great to kind of 
hear from people that actually do those things and see how they adapt that in real life. Anyone else has anything to add there or questions? Um, I can, well, one briefly respond to like writing negative tests. I mean, I think this is a great idea on the surface also, but that's obviously like a infinite problem. <laughs> I mean, you got to find some place where you stop writing negative tests. Otherwise, you, that's all you'll be doing. Oh, uh, so that could be problematic, I think. <laughs> for sure. But, um, like, there are very common, I would call them classes of negative tests that are, like, very straightforward to write when you think through what are the behaviors that you want. And they're behaviors that you should be thinking about. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what if I am missing arguments? What do I want to not happen, right? Yeah. Um, what if I have a string argument, someone passes me an A character, right? Like, writing those tests forces you to think about is it acceptable to pass an A or how to work from it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. It's, it's a good idea to do this also in cases where it's clear that's what needs to be happened. I just felt like you needed a bit, a bit of qualification that. <laughs> Oh, it's, yeah. It needs to be done like, in cases where it's really obvious, like what that needs to be, not just like randomly writing, like, well, it shouldn't say hello, somebody else, <laughs> because obviously it's not going to. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so not a cr criticism, just thought that needed to be qualified a little bit. And, and definitely, like, for very straightforward, simple functions, writing negative characters earlier, right? If I were writing a, like a file in court part or anything, right, where it's got many, many different ways it could go wrong, writing negative text in that case is a lot harder. Yeah. Um, so I also was going to comment just in general about the testing thing, and this is not like a strong something that I want to like. Uh, advocate or debate for just giving some like experience perspective on this like for one um i've noticed that when i do write tests like this where i write them very at least very early in the process and i sometimes feel like well there's two things that i think that are possibly negative in this case i'm interested if anyone else has this experience one is that um Sometimes I feel like once I write those tests, then I continue developing. I get really happy about running the tests and seeing them all pass. And I almost feel like it makes me not, it kind of discourages me a bit from like going back and writing more tests because I feel like it's already covering so much. And I'm like, oh yeah, all 400 tests pass, I'm good. And then I just keep writing. Um, so I feel like there's some slight dis incentive <laughs> to writing more tests when you do that. I don't know if anyone else experiences, but I've noticed that in myself a little bit. I have to remind myself, especially when I'm making substantial changes to go back and test them. Um, and then another thing I've noticed is, yeah, of course in this toy case, you have a, such a ridiculously small thing that's happening that it's kind of easy to wrap your head around what the testing is, but often like I'll write a function, I want it to return a file path or something, but then a week later or two weeks later, I actually want it to return a string under certain conditions or something, and then yeah, I can go back and write another test or should write another test, but um, sometimes I make changes that where the test literally has to change, and I'm wondering if, well, how people feel about that experience, where like you, it's not about like just adding a new test that that tests a new functionality, but like literally what you want it to do literally changes it and you have to change the test. And I feel a bit of disincentive there also because I almost feel like changing the test is like the antithesis of the whole thing. Like if you're, if you're changing an existing test, you're doing something really bad. And I know like I have to get over that at some point <laughs> because it's necessary, but I, I notice like I have a very strong reaction to like getting to the point where like I have to change the test or change existing tests. I wonder if people have experience with that, what they have to say about that. Um, I have experienced that. And 
the realization that I've come to is the reason that you're feeling disincentivized is because you should feel disincentivized. Um, because when you like very fundamentally change what a function does, you are altering the contract between you and your fellow programmers that there will be an established, well-defined behavior for this function. So it, it's not to say that it shouldn't happen, but that disincentive is actually a good thing because that is what allows other people on your team to make use of the code you have written without fear of it changing out underneath them. Okay, I'd like to also add my opinion there. Um, I, I, you know, I think you know the more um, kind of as Alex suggests, you know, the more a piece of code is uh, used and people is familiar with, um, kind of the code has has proven its its worth. And I think that naturally the least that is going to change, and uh, maybe if you need to change it in a way, maybe you want to leave that as a you know user exposed function and then maybe change its internals or something. But I also think that in the, uh, at some in, in early stages of development, a lot of the times you know uh, you're just figuring out what's the best way. So before you call something like release and you announce it very broadly, that's why you know you have opportunities to to play with the code yourself and to share it with someone and to you know ask for a review. And at that stage, you know, I, I feel like very comfortable changing tests because I think it's just, you know, part of the evolution. Basically, how I see them is just exactly as Alex said, it's like as the written contract between, you know, the code and uh, and, and the people that use that code. Um, but then as, as uh, the contract evolves, because sometimes the requirements change and sometimes not even they change, but also they enter in conflict. You know, sometimes today, you know, you need something to be, you know, some, you know, so let's say, you know, the project owner says, oh, this should be a data frame. But then you think, oh, no, actually, you know, this should be a file saved in a computer. And, you know, the, the, the requirement, requirement has changed. So if it's the same function, then, you know, of course, the test will have to change. Uh, and maybe what Alex is suggesting, I suppose, is, okay, maybe it shouldn't be the same function. Maybe it should be a different one with a different name. But all in all, and to summarize, I, I particularly feel uh, more or less... Um, happy about changing tests depending on uh, the stage of development and in general I think that is a good idea to just keep keep you know the two things evolving in parallel you know and particularly to prune tests that are also false positives too too often yeah uh, and like I definitely don't want to to stymie uh, creativity or finding a solution that works, right? Um, I just, I am very much of the mindset that if the finding the solution that works involves changing something that other people might be relying on, um, that that should involve enough of a burden that it makes you second guess whether this is the correct solution. Yeah, fair enough. And then there, you, there you, times it is the correct solution and that's fine. Um, but that's part of the value of having an entire team do test-driven development because it's entirely possible that I will write some code, set it aside for three months and forget about it. Um, and in the when I come back and I want to make these changes, change the return type, right? Um, if what I want to do um, in those intervening three months, Morrow used some of my code somewhere in something he was working on, um, that will show up in the tests. And it will be, I'll look at it and be like, cool, what test is failing? Why is this test failing? Oh, I didn't write that. Maro is using my function without me knowing, which is totally fine. Um, but now I know that that is a thing that I can't break. Cool. And, and I need to find some other solution yeah. to 
work around that. Uh, I would like to, to uh, address also the comment, maybe an, an end uh, close to now because we are a, a bit beyond. Um, but to also address the comment that CJ made about um, you know how much testing is necessary, and we had a conversation with him here, so I wanted to just kind of bring that conversation to to everyone. And this is the idea of you know regardless of the number of tests, um, you know you are kind of more or less confident when when you cover when you know that all code is covered by tests. It doesn't mean that it's correct. Yeah, you can have wrong code that is fully tested, but it's a great starting point. So I was kind of here, I wanted to show, you know, this, this feature of the cover package that, uh, is, you know, you can find it as an add-in, it's called a report test coverage for a package, and it will run this report that shows you in green uh, lines that are covered by tests. And, you know, if you uh, say, if I remove, say, this, uh, this second test, uh, and I rerun it, I, you know, I should see some red lines because uh, those lines are not tested. So I think that's, you know, to me, gives me, well, I know why, do, 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 do. I think some, let's, let's be a bit more aggressive and remove more of this. Um, I think to me, that's a good parameter, you know, to see uh, visually, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing something wrong here. I was expecting this line to be uh, red, the one that says stops if not, because that, part isn't covered, maybe I need to restart. And anyway, there is a tool that shows you exactly which lines of code are covered and which lines of code are not covered by tests. And regardless of the number of tests, you know, if, you, if you all, all your code is, is covered, then, you know, I feel confident. And you can also try things out, like, you know, you comment a, a line out um, and then rerun uh, your tests and, and, you know, you should see that, uh, you know, the tests fail which gives you some confidence that around that line that you're about to change, uh, you have a very good safety network, safety net. I'll throw in here, since you talked about coverage, um, that coverage is sort of held up as this golden standard. Like, it's a very measurable metric by which you can assess your code. Um, but it's also a deeply flawed one because it's very easy to write many uh, useless tests or tests that aren't actually testing the code you think it is in ways. Um, so like writing good tests requires add more thought than actually writing good code. Um, and, and test coverage doesn't reflect that. Like, for example, um, in the coverage report Maro just showed us, there was that line that was said that it had full test coverage or like multiple test coverage um, because it was getting called every time, but we didn't actually write any tests for the stop if not character function. Um, and so that is a thing that can be dangerous because <clears throat> um, right now we don't actually have a way to know if stop if not character works the way that we intend it to. All we know is that it works in a positive case which permits other functions which call it to work. Um, writing good tests is hard. <laughs> um, and that's part of why I like that. Yeah, if I could just bounce off of that, like actually all of that, and I said I think it also applies to tests as well. I mean, I've been finding that both the coverage tests and the tests in general can give me a, at least a bit of a false sense of security if they're not like really adequately checked. But the one thing I do appreciate about both of them is. And honestly, when the tests that I've been building and writing recently and the coverage tests that I've been doing recently, they often tell me things not like I made some dramatic problem where I'm returning a character string instead of a data frame that would totally break anything. But it's actually like pointing out little things like I'm, I do a, a commit and then I realize I made a, a simple spelling mistake or something that was stupid and the test will show that up. Or, um, you know, I think I wrote a really robust test for everything, and then I run the coverage test, and I realize, like, oh, yeah, I'm not testing that one, like, check if it's a character or not. 
So for me, they've been like super useful in those little kind of minor issues. But yeah, I also feel like sometimes they can give you a bit of a false sense of security. Yeah, no, several reports are hugely useful. They just should not, I, I have trouble with them being used as a metric, right? Um, like the idea of like, our code is 100% covered by tests, therefore it can go to production, is I would rather have code that is 70% tested, um, but like we're really happy with the quality of tests that are being run on it. Okay, I guess that we need to uh, wrap up here. Uh, we uh, went beyond the half past with agreement by Alex because he said that uh, we weren't this time stepping in his meeting. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for for that extra time. Um, maybe any departing question or comment? Hi, I'm uh, well, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think it would be nice to have a follow up that goes into strategies for um, sort of moving an existing function into something um, that. Closer to what we were talking about here, yeah. um, and whether there are sort of like clear situations where you would say it makes more sense to sort of like start new uh, versus trying to sort of squeeze something that's already there, yeah, like kind of into this um, setting. Uh, that will be, uh, yeah, that will be quite interesting to me. Sorry, so to clarify, so you are, you're saying to follow up with um, a, a strategies not for writing new code, but for injecting tests in existing code. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, of course, then it's not really TDD. I, I get that, but um, still, like to some degree, uh, like maybe there is sort of a, a threshold where one could say um, if the code that you sort of want to, to have tested uh, is this or that um, complex or, I don't know, good or bad or whatever, uh, then it makes more sense to actually start over and like have the proper TDD set up versus a situation where you'd say, okay, yeah, that's like, close enough to something that we can just like stick in some more tests and then that's fine. I don't know, something that just some guidance there, if possible, or maybe there is like no such, uh, yeah, guidance or way to to solve that. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, to have uh, an array of um, strategies, and um, and yeah, maybe depending on the situation, apply one or the other. Uh, it's not in my head um, any. I don't remember any kind of clear cut. Um, guideline, but uh, I will kind of be attent. Uh, I have read some things that suggest mixing strategies depending on things, so I'm, I, I may be able to find something. Um, Taylor, uh, it would be nice to at least hear your voice and say hi. And Hello. Hello. Sorry, yeah, I didn't have a lot of feedback on this. I was only half paying attention, but I very much uh, appreciate the walkthrough and I've, I've never used test that so that was uh, a new package for me great 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 okay um thank you very much this is the last data science incubator of the year uh with this you know we have um we have uh, all that there is for this year i look forward to seeing you next year then 2021 keep safe and have a great great uh, end of the year uh, celebration so no point this um death. Meeting later, right? I don't think so.